Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Joseph Schachter, founder of the Schachter Energy Report, online at SchachterEnergyReport.ca. He's speaking to us from Calgary. Welcome back to the show, Joseph. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be with you again, Jim. Has the forest fire smoke moved in on Calgary yet? No, it's uh, pretty clear skies. Uh, up in Edmonton, uh, where I've got family, they're saying that the uh, it is already impacting the area, but not as bad as we've had l- uh, prior summers. And... Uh, the you know with the we just had a little bit of rain in the last few days so uh, they're saying that that's helped a little bit to control the fires but uh, people in the Fort Mac area um, some of the suburbs have had to uh, leave the area um, because the fires were getting close to their homes so um, it's still very early in, in fire season um, we're going to have cooler and wet weather this week so hopefully just hopefully we get enough rain that. Uh, the firefighters can get ahead of it. And I believe Alberta is the only jurisdiction in Canada that has firefighting equipment, aircraft that can fly at night. That I don't know, but, uh, you know, we, the, you know, the, the fires are so important, uh, you know, or in terms of damage to, you know, local communities up north there, First Nations communities. Um, of course, you've got the oil, oil patch up there. Uh, so there's a lot of economic uh, impact if, if uh if they're not, uh, the fires are not controlled very quickly, and uh, the government has done the right thing of making sure we're ready. Um, and, of course, with drier and drier climates, they've got no choice. Now, what kind of an impact will it have on the oil markets if they have to evacuate Fort McMurray? Well, the key is, will they have to shut in the production up there, the, the SAG-D, the thermal oil, uh, all of that uh, oil sands, all of that, uh, you know, you know, is is a, you know can be shut in if the fires get as bad as they have been in the past. If that's the case, remember Canada produces almost six million barrels a day of crude oil, of which over three million comes from that Fort Mac area. Mm. What kind of an impact did it have the last time they had to pull out because of the raging flames? Well, it was impact, of course, uh, you know, to, for communities that were able to take in people who effectively were refugees because of the leaving their homes behind. The insurance industry, of course, had to, re, you know, big tag for rebuilding the community um, and uh, putting in fire breaks now more than they did before. Um, the oil sands companies all had to spend a ton of money rebuilding. Um, so uh, it was pretty nasty. Like, you know, like remember the floods we had in Calgary, um, you know, the, you know, many insurance companies, uh, you know, we're not good uh, citizens and weren't there quickly to pay and uh, weren't there to help rebuild. Um, you know, some of the most noted names in Canada, which you think of would be good, I'm not going to point out names, were terrible. And yet some names that you didn't think would be good were good. So it really, really is, a, you know, a, a difficult situation. And if we do have severe fires, um, the poor people who rebuilt may have to go through that whole cycle again. And what's the labor situation for the Alberta oil patch? If they have to evacuate from there, does that mean they're short employees again? Well, the industry's tight anyway because you've got an active rig season uh, drilling, uh, especially for heavy oil wells now that the TMX is open. Uh, the rig count in, in Canada has picked up uh, nicely, um, you, know, with, you know, which surprises people that, you know, with, given how bad the rig count situation is in the USA, I'm just pulling out last Friday's run, um, and the U.S. Uh, you know is down 19 percent in rig count, 605 versus 748. In Canada, we're up 29 percent 
120 rigs versus 93. And in the mix, uh, we have 60 rigs of those 120. Half of the rigs are drilling for liquids rich natural gas, and half of them are drilling for oil. And that oil number compares to 34 a year ago, up 76%. And the big choice there, the big move there, is to drill up heavy oil wells um, to um, move move into the TMX pipeline um, and to the coast. Uh, but you've heard all the crazy stories that they, there's not enough tugboats to move the boats. The, the type of ships that are there are smaller than the, than the, the big ones that they need to move the crude. Um, uh, you know the the flu. You know they're talking about fluid issues um, in the mix there. So um, you know the TMX. Uh, you know going to you know eight hundred ninety thousand BUEs a day or barrels a day um, is just not happening to the degree people thought. And there's a lot of birthing pains. But then again, that you know any new project has them. But um, the fact that the shipping uh, is a big issue, I think, is going to make it hard. To, you know, you'll be able to sh- ship in smaller ships to the U.S., or you're going to be sh- shipping uh, in the smaller ships, and then they go out off, you know, offshore, and then they transport the oil and move the oil to larger ships to move to Asia. That just adds to the costs, and um, you know, the likelihood is a lot of our oil from Alberta is going to end up in California because the California restrictions are so tough, and they have refineries that need heavy oil, so. Um, you know, while we've heard of India taking a load and China taking a load, I think the majority of the loads are going to probably end up going to California. Hmm. Uh, will someday uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline bring down gasoline prices in Vancouver, which are the highest in North America? Uh, have you won a lottery yet? <laughs> you bought? Come on. The, look, the taxes are a big difference. Transportation adds to it. Um, and uh, the cost of real estate for gasoline stations is higher. Um, if we're sitting at a buck fifty-two in Calgary, I bet you're a buck ninety right now. Um, probably around two bucks. Yeah. So yeah. Well, downtown Vancouver has no gasoline stations. Yeah. Well, the real estate isn't is obscene. You know, you cannot. And then, of course, with uh, you know, what are what are gasoline stations going to do when they grow up? Uh, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, are they going to put in, um, you know, A&Ws or, 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 or Tim Hortons next to them? Are they going to put in uh, charging stations or, you know, for, you know, fast charging stations so people can go in, get a gas, go get a coffee or go get a charge up fast with a fast speed charger and then go away in their EV uh, after getting the coffee? Uh, you know, the, this whole uh, issue of what's going to happen for the transportation system going forward, just as, you know, for all the government's rhetoric, we want this, we want that, nobody seems to have thought about the implications of it and started planning it and working with industry to get there. It's just so stupid. We'll have more with Joseph Schachter right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Joseph Schachter. Joseph, did Canada miss the boat when uh, the federal government refused requests from countries like Germany to improve our ability to get liquefied natural gas to them? It was a non-starter. They want to sell them, um, you know, hydrogen. Uh, how the hell do you make the hydrogen is an issue. Uh, so to me, uh, you know, Ottawa just, uh, you know, talks, talks a good story. Uh, but, the, you know, there's no way we're going to um, meet any of the goals that they talk about um, or any of the promises that they're talking about. Uh, it sounds good politically. Uh, the left loves it. The the, energy, the environment minister loves to hear that that stuff, uh, but uh, you know, for the man in the street in Canada, it's a non-starter. Um, and uh, you know, think about the cost of transporting hydrogen and making hydrogen, and then the economics are not going to work. You might as well use that electricity directly, shouldn't you? It would be more efficient than to use electricity to make hydrogen. Yeah, but where's the electricity going to come from? Yeah. Is it going to be cogen? Is it going to be more hydro? You know, how much more of Labrador can Quebec, uh, you know, Quebec Hydro dam up? 
you know, and, and how much more is Labrador and Newfoundland going to take of it? You know, they, they, you know, it, it, and what are the First Nations going to say about all the damage that's being done? You know, they were talking for a long time that all of the new LNG projects from the West Coast were all going to be using electricity from hydro, and then the hydro people say, oops, we can't do it. We don't have it. We don't have the rivers. We don't have the facilities. Well, some of that uh, natural gas have to be used to generate the power to compress it to ship it overseas. Yeah, but there's so much gas that could be available for cogen, um, and uh, you know, you, 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 w- w- there's no reason why the 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 new projects can't be allowed to use it. Just think that if you displace um, with LNG two, three, four coal plants with that are using dirty coal in China and India. Isn't the planet better off? And yet, the federal government and the and BC government is thinking just about the uh, carbon emissions coming from a project, not the fact that the total carbon impact for the climate of the planet is way, way better. And that's the numbskull thing about this whole this whole situation, is that the idiots don't seem to want to look at it from a global perspective. They're just trying to play the local political game. BC has a 200-year proven reserve of natural gas. Is a, when did natural gas become such a, a bad deal? I remember when uh, they wanted everybody to convert their cars to natural gas. Well, natural gas, you know, you've got buses that are using it now. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, propane vehicles and that. Um, electric vehicles, uh, buses now you're seeing, uh, electric trucks uh, are becoming a you know, product that, that may have some life for short distances. Um, you know, but the, the, the EVs, um, China's t- is, is got the lowest cost batteries. Um, you know, tell me a, a plant in, that's being built in Ontario for Honda for batteries is going to be cheaper than those batteries being made in China and shipped to Canada. And yet, and yet you now have Biden in the, this week saying, oh, I'm going to put a 100% tariff on China's EVs. Well, there are no EVs coming into the United States. That was just a political stunt. And uh, the only way China gets EVs in is if they play the free trade game and build the uh, factories with high percentage of North American parts so that they can be part of the, um, you know, the, the free trade agreement between Mexico, the United States, and Canada. And a lot of Chinese companies are looking at doing that, BYD and others, Geely, and then they're going to uh, have a lot of their suppliers build plants in Mexico. Mexico on the border becomes the winner, and uh, they export the the product to to the United States and maybe someday to Canada. And, uh, you know, their price point can be as low as $10,000. You know, uh, high-end vehicles are, are like, you know, are even cheaper than, uh, but we're seeing from Tesla, and that's why Tesla's lowered the prices to compete against NIO and Geely and BYD and all the other companies that are in China. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, and, and the lineup, uh, you know, of, of Tesla is they haven't refreshed their lineup at all. And so, you know, well, you know people want to see the newest gadgets and want to see newer features. And, you know, one of the companies in China, I think, has got a real good gig going. It's NIO, N-I-O, and what happens is you, know, you drive up uh, to one of their facilities, you get out of the, you know, you can stay in the car or get out of the car and have a coffee, and they'll take the battery out from underneath you, put in a new battery, and then you can just go and drive off. And so, um, you know, you don't have to worry about charging them. And, um, you know, in densely populated parts of China, that's going uh, to be a good marketing game. Sure, your service station actually will do some service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, the, and the key thing is, how, after how many years, six years, eight years, ten years, depending upon the quality of the battery, do you have to replace? And do you know what the cost of replacing that battery is? A lot of people don't realize it could be ten to $20,000. Now, uh, petroleum itself, uh, again, you have all these people protesting. If it's uh, coming out of the ground, it's evil, it's horrible. But we're still going to need rubber for tires, rubber for uh, a million other uses, plastics and so on. Uh, Why do they want to kill petroleum, period? Well, you're you're getting the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the the elitists, you know, you know, uh, know, in on the on the coast and in the big cities 
um, you know, saying that we can drive down the demand for fossil fuels and it's going to make the environment better. They're missing one big point. All of the things that go into um, electricity grids, copper, um, if it's going to be lithium, if it's going to be nickel, if it's going to be aluminum, are, are, are come out of third world countries and the people there want to be paid well. They want to have the same quality of life as we do. They want transportation. They want education. They want more protein in their diet. And so the demand growth that we're going to see between now and the end of the decade is all going to come from those emerging countries, emerging world entities in South America and Asia and, and you know, in, in, in Africa. And the uh, demand in the OECD countries is forecast to decline as we bring on more uh, more um, EVs. But the, but the point people have to re, 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 to keep in the mind is that the data centers and the electricity demand and the repair of the electricity grid is going to be so expensive that we probably won't be able to uh, see the demand for fossil fuels, oil, gas, um, you know, uh, heating oil, decline between now and the end of the decade. The assumptions being made by the optimistic climate people just don't have any reality check to them. Look how long it took us to wean off horses. Horses were still still a big part of transportation for armies in the Second World War. Oh, yeah, well, and, and look what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, you're still seeing donkeys and horses being used actively, um, it just, it's just a sorry event, and, you know, if it's Iraq or if it's uh, Afghanistan or if it's uh, Syria or if it's uh, Palestine, uh, is, you know, the Gaza portion, um, you know, it, it, you know the, the West Bank is a different story. Um, it's, it's more industrialized, more jobs. It's uh, interrelated uh, with the economies nearby, Jordan and Israel on either side of them. So the people there have a better quality of life. But um, Egypt, you know, you'll still see in rural Egypt uh, use of um, animal transportation. Joseph, we usually uh, end the interview with uh, some hard numbers. So what are some of the numbers we should be looking at in the uh, petro area? Well, number one, uh, because we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the inventory is building. I wrote that up in the Eye on Energy, and people can go to the website and, and sign up for that free product of ours. We're seeing, uh, you know, uh, we were down below $77 in WTI this week, just based on the fact that of the inventory bills before the summer driving season, which, you know, hits, you know, on the July, July long weekend, I think we could see below $75 for WTI. I also believe there's still a war premium of 5 to $8 out there because of the, the Rafah Israel invasion there. Uh, to go after the last of the Hamas brigades, if we do see at some point a ceasefire and 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 the, and the hostages released, question is how many of them are still alive? You know, w when the deal that they were talking about was for 33 hostages, and uh, Hamas was saying, well, we can only give you some of them alive; the rest are dead. They don't have that many alive. So the you know Israel is going to go berserk when they find out how many were killed, um, and that uh, Hamas doesn't have the hostages that the that uh, uh, because they've been, um, you know, exterminated by uh, Hamas, uh, you know, and, and that is going to cause Israel even more angst and anguish. Uh, so it's, it's trouble there. The other thing I keep in mind is um, the, um, what we saw this week with the MEM stocks, um, Games, GameStop, um, AMC, uh, all these stocks went berserk. That's the kind of thing you see at the end of a bull market where, you know, not, nutty things happen, and, you know, the, the kids on their chat lines, uh, you know, Reddit to uh, start driving stocks up. That's a very bad sign. Of course, remember, we saw that with Peloton <laughs> in 2020, uh, 2021, um, and look where that is now. Um, I think the, the general stock market is uh, vulnerable here. Um, it's had new highs day after day, euphoria everywhere. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the CPI data, uh, was was a little muted, so people jumped all over that and said inflation's under control. Fed's going to cut interest rates in September, but they're ignoring the PPI number, which said the inflation rate is six percent and service inflation is seven percent. 
and those are embedded, and those are getting worse. So, um, and then remember, there's a war economy in the United States, which means you know that's not going to that's going to keep on going, which is inflationary. So, um, I think the assumption that the market has of happy days are here again um, is something to be worried about. Uh, some of your other interviews probably have even more dire uh, warnings than I do. My biggest concern is the U.S. debt bomb and two billion, two trillion dollars of financing that has to go through. And if there ever was bond vigilante rejection of the pricing and the yields, and they walk away, uh, China and India, they are not. Uh, China and Japan are not there to buy U.S. Treasuries anymore. They've got their own problems, and they're selling uh, Treasuries. Um, we could see some kind of a uh, problem there. And uh, if interest rates, uh, for example, on the two-year get back over 5%, and I think we're 473 or something uh, today, that to me would be disconcerting for the general stock market. So just a, a fair warning that uh, there's too much euphoria out there. People may want to take some profits um, and uh, be careful just in case uh, we do see uh, the FANGs, the MEMS, the M7s, um, have, a, have a, a slap in the face. Yeah, so far we haven't seen the sell in May and go away syndrome or phenomena. Well, as, uh, as, as you see, we're only May 16th, so yeah. uh, a lot can happen in the last two weeks of the month. Joseph, thank you so much for chatting with us. My pleasure as always, Jim. You take good care. My guest has been Joseph Schachter, founder of the Schachter Energy Report online at schachterenergyreport.ca. He was speaking to us from Calgary. If you have any questions for Joseph or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Find us on X at How Street. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.